Break Hard Podcast back for another week. We had everybody in action this weekend. I'm your host, Matt. Obviously, I'm the only host here. Nobody else will be joining us this week. We are going to get started with the NASCAR series at Talladega. We had NASCAR Cup and Xfinity at Talladega. We had IndyCar out in Long Beach, and we had Formula One running their parade over in China. We'll get to that at the end of this, as well as touching on a little WEC action, because I have a theory. Starting off at the top, though, we have the NASCAR Cup Series Geico 500 at Talladega. The big talk going into the weekend was the removal of the scoring pylon. So quick update on the scoring pylons. If you saw my video uh, where I very tongue-in-cheek said that they're being hunted down and put on the endangered species list, this and that. So basically what it came down to was the fact that the company that makes the pylons, that supplies the parts, that manufacture them, those pylons are just obsolete now. They don't make parts for them anymore. So there's no way, way that they could really repair them. Obviously, they could if somebody wanted to go out there and manufacture the parts on their own or something like that, but that's not very cost-effective. So NASCAR ISC removed it at Talladega, and SMI removed theirs at Texas. A new pylon costs about $5 million. So the chances of a new one getting put up seem pretty slim at this point. But if NASCAR ISC or SMI would have just come out and said that, I'm like, hey, listen, Yes, we know it's not the you know best course of action. We don't want to remove this, but it doesn't work anymore. There's no way for us to get parts. Okay, like that's a sufficient answer. And instead, they just didn't give anybody any answers. You just had to get some information from people that were like in the know, and it was very frustrating. To just you could have avoided this whole nonsense by just doing that. So we go to Talladega. There's not a scoring pile on there. Very unfortunate uh, because. You might not care about the running order so much at Talladega because it's constantly changing, but you certainly care about the number of laps in the race. And as a fan in the stand where your phone typically doesn't work, I did see one person say that their phone worked really well at Talladega this week and the Wi-Fi was good. Love to hear that. That's a good thing. That's a step in the right direction. We absolutely need that everywhere. And hopefully all ISC tracks continue to follow along with that because Daytona is great. Indianapolis is great. Obviously, they're an independent track owned by Penske Corporation. But the Wi-Fi and the cell service at those tracks is really good. Now, if it's good at Talladega, that's promising for other tracks as well. But they were like, oh, you can just look at the NASCAR app on your phone and track the race there. We don't want to take our eyes away from the racetrack, though. That's why we're at the track. If I wanted to look at my phone, I would just sit at home and watch it there. So didn't love the messaging behind it. But if they would have just come out and been like, yeah, listen, this is why we had to remove it. Okay, like that's at least an answer. Not giving anybody an answer just felt like they were being greedy. And they're just like, oh, we don't care about the fan, the at track experience for the fan, which there's a lot of fans that do believe that. I don't necessarily not 100% on board with that. There's certainly some tracks where it's like, whew, that's not great. The actual race, though. So NASCAR had a fuel conservation race at Talladega. And instead of riding single file, they decided to ride three wide, which is what we've seen them do the last couple of years here. And the next gen car combined with the stages has set up for these fuel mileage races, essentially at Daytona and Talladega, where the cars just ride around at 70, 60 percent throttle, about five to six seconds off the pace. Essentially, the whole pack is just riding around five, six seconds off the pace. It's noticeable, too. Like when you're watching on TV, you're like they are going substantially slower than what they probably should be. And yes, there were 73 lead changes on Sunday, which is great, right? I think that's the second most from the non-tandem era. Was it a good race, though? Eh, I was waiting for somebody to just try to break away from the pack. Obviously, you know, with stages that there's a, there's an end, right? There's an infinite, there's a finite, finite amount of laps left. So you can kind of base it off of that. At the end of the race, the Toyotas had basically kind of taken that strategy. And they were going to try to make a run for it. They short pitted. As soon as their window opened, they pitted so that they could just go full bore and run about four seconds a lap faster than what the Chevys and the Toyota or the Fords and the Chevys were doing. Ultimately, that plan didn't end up working because all they had to do was stay in line and not wreck, and they wrecked. But we'll get to that in a moment. The riding around three wide visually looks really, really good. Um, I think that's like a great thing to get the casual fan to tune in. Right. It's I mean, I saw it in person at Daytona earlier this year, and it looked fantastic. You're like, this is one of the coolest things ever because they're three wide, 10 rows deep, essentially. And everybody's just around the track together. Looks really cool. You can make moves and make passes if you want to go ahead and go to 100 percent throttle because everybody else is riding around at like 70. So there's moves to be made. But then as soon as you're done saving fuel, like what we saw at the end of the race, between the two lanes, which is essentially one led by Michael McDowell, the other one led by Tyler Reddick, passing was next to impossible. The third lane got moving, 
and Ty Gibbs jumped up and absolutely screwed them over before marriage, as somebody pointed out on Twitter, which I thought was hilarious. And that whole lane fizzled out and essentially ruined any chance that we had at getting a third lane going and people actually being able to make moves. NASCAR said after Daytona, they were going to look into this because they didn't necessarily love the fact that everybody was just riding around saving fuel. Now we've got to Taldega, and it was far more egregious, in my opinion, this time than what it was back at Daytona. Are they going to look at it? I don't know. There's few things that they can do. They can change the stage lengths. They can alter the size of the fuel cell. Outside of that, we're kind of left with what we're, with what, we're what we have. I think that there needs to be an overall look at the entire super speedway package because as much as people kind of complained at the end of the Gen 6 era that the, the runs were just too big because the cars were punching such a big hole in the air, the draft would really just give you these gigantic runs. It was entertaining and you could make moves. With this new package, you can't make moves at all. Like it is really, really hard. It's a track position race. Super speedways have become a track position race the same way that short tracks have become track position. It is so difficult to try to move up through the field, especially when they're not saving fuel, that it makes for a really boring race at the end. And that's kind of what we saw. So on Sunday, we had a lot of things happening. Well, we had a lot of fuel saving going on. People are going to complain about the Fox broadcast. It wasn't the best broadcast we've ever seen. We know that. Let me throw in a few things, though. This is typically the second highest rated race on Fox's portion of the schedule. The Spring Talladega race always draws basically the second most amount of viewers for Fox this portion of the season. Fox is going to always sell a lot of advertising for this race because they're going to get the best bang for their buck out of this. What's really unfortunate about it is that means that there's a lot of commercials, a lot of full screen commercials. I'm in the camp of you have to figure out a way to always have side-by-side -side commercials when you're at super speedways because it's one of those tracks that you just can't miss any of the action because things can happen at any time. It's you're fascinated by it. It's not like Pocono where everything gets strung out and you're like, all right, if you go to commercial, you come back. Typically, you're not missing anything. Talladega on Sunday, we missed the first crash of the day between, between Christopher Bell, Chase Elliott, barely, barely skirting through there. And we missed it because we were at commercial. And they didn't even preempt the commercials where they jump back in and be like, we're back live at Talladega. Crash is broken out. And like they used to do back in the day. Now nah, we came back and then we leisurely, 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 Went and looked at a replay, and then this and that, and Clint was making jokes, and it was like, well, it didn't have that like excitement that Talladega typically has. There were a few other parts of the broadcast. People are always going to complain about the commercials. There were a lot of them. Uh, Mike Joy had some weird lines as well, uh, which is frustrating because Mike Joy used to be really, really good. Uh, the Richard Petty amount of laps line that he had was very awkward and felt weird when he said it. He also said that the 99 made a costly error pitting right before the stage end, except it was a genius pit call. The 99 knew that they would be able to take the wave around if they pitted with three to go, got fresh tires and fuel, got the wave around, and then had tires and fuel already. Genius pit call by them. But the booth somehow seemingly missed that. And I should ask, I just want to know, I, I should ask if there's like a stat person. Say, I know there's a stat person. Is there somebody behind the scenes that's kind of keeping track of strategy and what's going on outside of like Larry Mack? Because that, again, is something that the boost should be aware of to be like, oh, this is something that's happening. We should talk about it because it's an interesting call. Um, but yeah, that mess up. You had Boyer out there talking about how they kicked the weatherman's butt today because it said 90% chance of rain and we're going racing but it rained in the morning and that's what the 90% meant. So that was awkward, but that's a small critique as well. The rest of it just seemed, eh, it was not great. The end of the race, the big crash, you had them. It took six minutes to finally tell us that it was Corey LaJoy up on his side and flipping. What are we, what are we doing here? It's a wreck on the front stretch and we seemingly only had one or two camera angles of it. I just don't necessarily understand what's going into that. Maybe, you know, sometimes NASCAR like invites media members up into the booth to like watch how race control is run throughout a race. So you can kind of get like an idea. I would like Fox to let me come and just kind of sit in the production <laughs> for this for a race sometime just so I can see what goes into it. And then I would probably like way back off on criticizing because I'd be like, yeah, this is really, really hard. But I also think it'd be really interesting. So that all happened. There are some frustrating moments with the broadcast, of course. Everybody's going to complain about the broadcast, whether it's NBC or Fox. 
the racing, again, a lot of frustrations going on there as well. There was a really funny moment, though, for for me at least, where uh, towards the end of stage two, this is actually the most infuriating part of this. So everything I just said about um, the Fox broadcast, it's all summed up my frustrations in this one part. I'm trying to find this tweet real quick that that made me laugh. Uh, now I'm blanking on it. So basically, what it was, uh, to preface here, and this gets into what I was going to say. At the end of stage two, with five or six laps to go at the end of stage two, Fox decides to go to a full screen commercial, which is really, really frustrating because it's the closing laps of the stage, right? And we're constantly told how important stages are, this and that. And they go to a full screen commercial. Not great there. And you're like, okay, maybe it'll be side by side. No, we're wrong. It's full screen. So then they come back from the commercial. And they go right into a live read for Credit One. And then they go live right into a paid um, paid ad for pods. Um, the replay, like the big move of the race or something like that. And then they come back to Green Flag Racing with two laps to go on the stage. We watch the end of the stage. And then right back to commercial. So frustrating that they took away all this green flag running. And did anything important happen? No, not really. But it's still the fact that it's the end of the stage. And we're constantly told how stages, Mike Joy said this, when NASCAR implemented stages, that meant that the broadcast would be able to show 20% more green flag laps because more commercials would be run during the stage break. And that's just vehemently not true. We see actually more pictures of the cars on track during the stages than the uh, during the stage break than we do during the actual racing. We're constantly looking at cars just putting around for five to 10 minutes underneath a stage break. And then as soon as we go back racing, green flag wise, right back to commercial. It's infuriating. But at the end of stage two, this guy tweeted that he's watching in Germany and the German con commentators actually joked about what I just talked about, saying that the call was like, like we said, end of stage. Now it's going to get exciting. And just like that, the Americans go to commercial. So much for building suspense. And the broadcast, of course, continues overseas because they don't have commercial breaks like we do here in the States. Frustrating. Like I said, just maddening at times. So the end of the race. Let's get into that because that's really the only portion of this race that had things happen. Brad Keselowski put on an absolute master class in super speedway racing on that last lap. He's behind Mike McDowell. He's committed to McDowell. Down the backstretch, he shoves McDowell all the way out. Gets into turn three. Hammers the, not hammers the brake, drags the brake all the way back to the 10 car of Noah Gragson. Gragson hits him, gives him this huge push out of turn three. Keselowski's got this run on the 34. He goes to the outside coming onto the front stretch. McDowell goes up. Brad comes back to the inside, has him beat. Brad's turning underneath him. The 34 car comes flying down. Ernie Irvin style trying to throw a huge block like he's Joseph Newgarden at the Indy 500. Ends up losing it. 34 wrecks himself, essentially. Brad, if Brad hit him, he gave him that little love tap to just really send him the rest of the way. And then that chaos breaks out behind it. You have LaJoy getting up on his side, ends up flipping over. The four car, Josh Berry, got jacked in the rear end like Lance Stroll was behind him in China. You had a lot of wrecks happening. And you hate to see stuff get torn up at the end. Thankfully, everybody was okay and got out and walked away. But that's just kind of how these races play out. And Tyler Reddick, Ron Bouchard of the situation, and he ends up just skirting by for the win, and Brad Kozlowski once again has to finish second. Noah Gragson finishes third. Ricky Stenhouse Jr. quietly finishes fourth. I don't think we talked about him all day on the broadcast. Alex Bowen picks up his fourth top five of the season. The neck beards are still out here like, oh, that guy needs to get replaced, even though he's now equal to his top fives for both 2023 and 2022 through the first 10 races of this year. He's on pace for 12 top fives, but yes, we need to replace him. Just idiocy. Anthony Alfredo finished sixth, William Byron seventh, Todd Gillen eighth, Daniel Hamrick ninth, and Harrison Burton gets a top 10 finish for the Wood Brothers. I know they're going to talk about how that's great momentum for him. They're going to Dover. That momentum has already stopped. Overall, I think I give this race like a 72. Wasn't my favorite race in the world. It was sufficient. It was fine. People are going to complain all week about the crazy fuel saving. Would you rather them save fuel going three wide or save fuel running single file at the top? At least three wide is visually appealing. I did see some people from Sirius XM NASCAR, Pete Pistone, uh, namely. When I say people, I just really mean Pete. 
who carries the water for NASCAR at all times. And hey, if my paycheck came from NASCAR, I'd probably do the same. But I think criticism is also fair. I think that, you know, some sort of public discourse is good for the sport. Uh, I don't think you need to be negative all the time. Uh, and I think you need to talk about the positives when you can. And I certainly try to do that here. I know some people will be like, oh, all you do is complain. I don't only complain. I do complain a decent amount, though. But I think that discourse is fine because for all of the overly positive media members that we have, you need to have some people that are like, wait a second. Uh, we need to talk about this. And Pete Pistone carries the water for NASCAR at all times. NASCAR can do no wrong. And again, my, cha my paycheck came from that. I'd also say they don't do anything wrong. And he was like, people are complaining about the three wide racing. He's And he, his whole sentiment was, yeah, but if the casual fan tunes in to see this, they're going to think this looks really cool. Okay, but they're not going to tune in next week at Dover and be like, this is really cool. So you're sacrificing your product for a person that might tune in and be like, oh, this is really cool. And then immediately turn off and go watch LPGA or something. I have no idea what people watch. So, yeah, I didn't love that sentiment behind it. But I think NASCAR needs to take a look at it and try to figure out something. And maybe there's nothing to figure out, right? Uh, I saw Rodney Childers had a few ideas. I think some other people have some ideas on what can change. But for the most part, it's kind of broken in a sense. Moving on to the Xfinity race, though. Saturday at Talladega, the Ag Pro 300. Jesse Love picks up his first win of his career. He got out of the car, made the heart hands, Caitlin Clark style. Nobody told him to make that to them and they'd be just fine in the media center which was creepy greg doyle don't do that jesse love gets out and does that he wants to put it on a t-shirt i saw somebody be like don't be josh williams get your own brand and he's like dude my last name is literally love like the heart hand thing completely fits there so yeah i am completely on board with jesse love there jesse love wins riley herbst finishes second and then from there you have anthony alfredo leland honeyman brennan Poole. Cesar Baccarella, Matt Benedetto, Jeb Burton, Mason Massey, Haley Deegan, all of those finished in the top 12. And Brendan Poole had a chance to win this race coming off of turn four and ended up not. And everybody's complaining that the back markers didn't work together. They all worked against each other and let Jesse Love win. While true, they don't have experience running up front. So it's not really a shock that this happened with them because they don't necessarily know what they're doing. I saw Tommy Joe Martins, who is constantly, in my opinion, playing the woe is me card uh, more often than not, was like, oh, well, those guys just didn't want to wreck their equipment. Okay, but like a win's a win. I, I get it, but all right. So Jesse Love picks up his first win of his NASCAR Xfinity Series career. I think that is going to be the first of many. That kid has a lot of talent. Riley Herbst finishes second. Anthony Alfredo in the R Motorsports, number five finishes third. Leland Honeyman finishes fourth. At one point, I thought Leland Honeyman was going to win this race, and I was going to be flabbergasted, baffled, dumbfounded even. Brennan Poole finishes fifth in a car that had the same paint scheme of his number 48 DC solar car when he drove for Chip Ganassi Racing and should have won this race, but NASCAR gave the win to Elliott Sadler in a controversial finish, which I, again, still argue that Brennan Poole won that race. It would have been great redemption if he did win the race in his throwback, but... It wasn't meant to be. The extended package continues to be pretty good. Um, Austin Hill. All he wants to do is lead, guys. He just wants people to push him to the lead. He should be leading at all times. The kind of rich kid mentality whenever we get to super speedways with him. He did not win stage number one. And I jokingly said that Andy Petrie was fuming down on the pit box. Because... The two car slammed the door on the 21, getting a run. And sure enough, during the stage break, the 21 team keys up the mic and they're like, hey, just so you know, 21 car really had to get on their brakes there to make sure that they didn't run you over. To like guilt Jesse Love into being, you know, feeling bad that he won the stage and the 21 didn't. The, the Austin Hill love over at RCR is baffling to me. I get it. He's a cash cow. He's got sponsorship with them. He's keeping, you know, these programs running, but... Boy. So then he wins stage two. Austin Hill does. And everything's right in the RCR world. So later in the race, on about lap number 113 there towards the end of the race, there is the 21. Moves up in front of the 48. Tries to shut the door. The 48 just 
moves like hits him like uh you can't come here can't, yeah can't come up here dude spins the 21 out causes a huge wreck parker's in it uh the 21's in it the five is in it but still manages to finish third and there's a couple other people that get involved as well so austin hill didn't get a break cut for him for once he's out of the race not out of the race but he's out of contention for winning and not a single person on the internet seemed to feel bad about that at all so kind of tells you what you need to know about the 21 car there of austin hill the rest of this race so Xfinity continues to probably be the best um racing that nascar has at the moment it was it was fine it was an okay race it was better than the cup race for sure it wasn't a lot of fuel saving you can easily make pass not easily but you can make runs you can make passes everything about the Xfinity package is definitely a little bit better than the cup package is right now also on saturday at Talladega, we had the ARCA series at Talladega, where James Finch's kid, Jake Finch, led every lap of the every lap of the race. Not a single pass for the lead the entire ARCA race at Talladega. Coming to the checker flag, everybody just kind of stayed in line road. Not you cannot pass at ARCA in t- at Talladega or Daytona. I they shouldn't go there. Get these cars off of super speedways. The package is really bad. You either have to fix the, fix the package or well fix the package that's the only thing you can do or you just don't go because these kids aren't learning anything just riding single file like this it's just a really bad product and it's wasteful sure i love the fact that they did not tear up any equipment absolutely love that i hate the fact that nobody could pass one another you shouldn't be able to lead every single lap (laughs) at a super speedway race that's mind-boggling this isn't like jeff burton when they put a restrictor plate on the car at new hampshire back in what was that 2000 and he led every single lap. This shouldn't be happening. But it did. So that's really unfortunate. Moving on, though, we had the IndyCar race, the Long Beach Grand Prix, the Grand Prix of Long Beach, however you want to organize those words around. Yeah, Scott Dixon's just the guy. That guy is unbelievable at this point. He had no business winning this race and goes off strategy. Lap 15, caution comes out for Christian Rasmussen, not to be confused with Rasputin. Two completely different people. Um, very different, actually. Lap 15, caution comes out. The 12 car of Will Power pits from the lead, and then others follow him. So now we have two strategies. Some people stayed out, some people pitted. Pitting on lap 15 meant that you are going to have to hit this crazy fuel number if you are going to be able to make it to the end. Scott Dixon pitted with Will Power here. Scott Dixon goes on to hit this insane fuel number. And even he was like, I don't think we're going to be able to get this. And he does it. He gets it done. He wins. He had Joseph Newgarden absolutely breathing down his back, all up in his gearbox in those final closing laps uh, with like 15 to go. Uh, Newgarden caught Scott Dixon. And you're like, okay, Newgarden's going to blast past him. But then he just couldn't get a run off the corner that he could set up Scott Dixon to, to make a pass on him. And you're like, okay, maybe Dixon's going to be able to hold him off here. Newgarden, of course, is on the different strategy. He didn't pit with them at lap 15. He had fresher tires. He didn't have to save fuel. Still couldn't get around Dixon, which was really impressive on Dixon's part. And even after the race, Newgarden's like, I have no clue how they were able to stretch it as far as they did. Scott Dixon just makes fuel mileage. It's absolutely magical. Every single time he does it, you're like, there's no way he's going to do this. And yet he continues to do it. He leads 42 of the 85 laps. On Sunday, with nine laps to go, though, Dixon, in traffic, has started to back the field up. So now he has Newgarden behind him. Colton Hurd has now caught them as well. And Alex Pillow is there following in fourth place. Nine laps to go, going into the hairpin, uh, the final corner on the track. Newgarden breaks for the corner. Obviously, Herta gets into him just a little bit. Again, pulls a Lance Stroll, runs in the back of him like he's Daniel Ricciardo, lifts the rear tires of the two-car up off the ground. When that happens, the car goes into anti-stall. Sets it back down, and now the two car can't go off the corner because it's an anti stall. And Newgarden talked about it where he's like basically you have to double clutch it in a sense and grab a gear and then keep going. But because that happened, that went that dropped Newgarden from second back to fourth, and now Herta is going to go after Dixon, and he catches him, and he's running right behind him, and he ends up finishing the race about one second back, uh, eight tenths of a second back from from Dixon, just couldn't get around him again. So Herta ends up finishing second. Alex Pillow rounds out your podium in third. Newgarden finishes fourth. Marcus Erickson finishes in fifth. And Will Power 
who started on the front row, took the lead on turn one around the outside, goes on the same strategy as Dixon. He comes home six, which is unfortunate for him. Kyle Kirkwood, last year's winner, finishes P7. Roman Grosjean in that Hunkos Hollinger car finishes eighth. Felix Rosenquist, ninth after starting on pole. And Alexander Rossi goes from 13th to 10th. Rookie, Theo Porcher. Theo Porcher, the F2 champion. Um, the guy who has a lot of talent but just doesn't really have the funding to probably make it in Formula 1, uh, is on loan to McLaren while David Malukas continues to rehab his wrist. He goes from 22nd to 11th place. Had amazing things to say about IndyCar after the race, which you absolutely love to hear. Love when guys come over and sing the praises of IndyCar because it is currently the best championship going at the moment. This race made up for everything that Thermal wasn't as well as what St. Pete wasn't as well. This race was great top to bottom. Fantastic strategy, fantastic racing everywhere. I'm looking over my notes to make sure I don't miss anything. Um, Dixon, this win is his 20th consecutive season in IndyCar with a win. He has more consecutive seasons with wins than Kiffin Simpson, his teammate, has years on this planet. Think about that. That is absolutely wild. This very much, though, feels like it's going to be a heavy Penske, Ganassi, Andretti type of year. The top seven spots were dominated by the big three. Uh, top eight, if you include Felix Rosenquist in there, since he has an alliance with Andretti Global. But once again, that race was great top to bottom. Moving on to Formula One, the Chinese Grand Prix. Formula One makes a triumphant return to China after what having not having had a race there since 2019 max Verstappen shock wins the race i know i'm as surprised as you guys are he also won the sprint again very surprised the sprint was the only interesting thing out of the weekend for the most part as we're going there Verstappen wins lando norris finishes second which is a great result for him because they did not think that they were even going to be able to beat the ferraris Sergio Perez finishes in third, continues to underperform at times in that car. Charles Leclerc fourth, Carlos Sainz fifth, George Russell sixth, Fernando Alonso seventh, Oscar Piastri eighth, Lewis Hamilton 19th to ninth um, in the race after a second place finish in the sprint. And then Nico Hulkenberg in the Haas rounds out your top 10. I like China. I actually think the track layout's pretty good. I think it's pretty racy for the most part. This race did absolutely nothing for, for anybody, I don't think. It was it had okay moments. It didn't have great moments. And Max continuing to dominate certainly doesn't help things at all. It just is what it is. But I do think that Formula 1 is a bit of a feeder series for WEC. Because if you watch the WEC race, the World Endurance Championship this race from Imola, the six-hour, there are a number of ex-Formula 1 guys there. So I'm starting to think that Formula 1 might just be a feeder series, a stepping ladder for drivers to get to WEC. And if you did watch that, you watch Ferrari do what Ferrari does best and botch the strategy and hand away a race win because they were in position. They had the three fastest cars. And when the rain came, they did not strategize correctly. They end up losing the race. Kamui Kobayashi, NASCAR's favorite driver, goes on to win the race. So... Great to see NASCAR drivers out there representing on a world stage. He and his Toyota team uh, took the overall victory. Mike Conway, as well as Nick DeVries, you know, the guy that Red Bull kicked out halfway through the season last year because they didn't think he was talented enough to be a Formula One driver. He is, just not a Red Bull, but as a story for a different day. So thank you guys all for listening to this. I am really going to work on getting a co-host or like rotating co-host to potentially start joining. Maybe not next week because I do have a busy weekend coming up. I'll tell you about that in just a second. But for, you know, the week after, what would that be? Kansas weekend maybe. And then going forward, try to have somebody rotating in if possible. Uh, because me talking to myself here, it's fine. But I like to have some sort of banter back and forth. My weekend though is going to be very interesting. If I have, if anybody that listens to this goes to Bowman Gray or knows anybody that goes to Bowman Gray or a team, maybe let me know because I think I might be at Bowman Gray on Saturday night. I will be in Greensboro this weekend doing some commentary for Mav TV. Uh, I'll be on their GAA classic car auction. Um, yeah, being on TV. I believe Bob Varsha, Matt Yoakum, and Ryan Newman are a part of it, which is going to be really exciting to get down there and get some work. So if you want to see me on live television, you can see me. On Friday from, I think, uh, 11 to 4 or 12 to 4 on MAV. And then on Saturday from 12 to 3, East Coast time. So, pretty exciting uh, to be doing that. 
Looking forward to it. I'll recap everything next week when I get back. We have the NASCAR Xfinity and Cup Series at Dover next weekend. I believe IndyCar is off to... Now I have to double check because I don't remember dates off the top of my head. Yes, IndyCar is off to Alabama next weekend at Barber. Always a good race there. Formula One is off for two weeks. Their next race will be Miami uh, a fortnight from now. And yes, IMSA is off as well. Trucks will return at Kansas. Like and subscribe to the channel. Follow me on TikTok at BreakHard. Instagram and Twitter at BreakHardBlog.